All right, fellas, I'm James O'Neill. You're here with O'Neill Ops, and this is the channel where we break it down. We go into detail with the equipment that we use and how we use that equipment application specific. Once again, today, we're gonna to be taking a look at a custom rifle that we had built for predator hunting at night. Let's get started. Looking at this rifle, we're going to go into detail like we always do on all of the build components and we're going to pay specific attention to the thermal because after all the thermal, the weapon sight on this rifle is what makes it so application specific. But like I said, we're going to break this thing down and a lot of you guys will notice that this is a very similar rifle to the, the setup that I went over about a month ago with the Mark III 60 millimeter from Trijicon. It's, it's basically the same identical rifle. It's just, I mean, it's chambered with the same reamer. It's got the same barrels, the same stock, the same trigger, the same action, but they are, they're different. I mean, they're just a different piece of equipment. So with that said, let's break this down. Let's take a thorough look at it. And then we're gonna go into some detail on the thermal. Let's just take a look at the stock. This is the Manners T5A. This is probably one of my go-to stocks. It's one of my most favorite, most comfortable, most ergonomic stocks that I have used. It, it's just a, a real comfortable feel. This particular uh, stock has the carbon fiber, which uh, Manners terms it as the elite shell. It essentially shaves off a pound of their traditional synthetic stocks. And that's what our design was on these rifles. It was a lightweight rifle. And so that's why we went with the carbon shell, the, the, uh, the elite shell, the elite stock from Manners to eliminate a pound. This stock has the Manners mini chassis. What that does is it eliminates really any gunsmithing work. You don't have to have your gunsmith fill the barrel channel. You don't have to have him fill up with epoxy and then inlet it, bed it. It's a it's a, a sh aluminum pillar design, uh, aluminum bedding block design, I should say, that essentially is blueprinted for a Remington 700 action, and or a or a Remington 700 clone blueprint, etc. Which this action is, and we'll go over it. But basically, you put your two action screws in, you torque them to specs, and you're done. It eliminates the bedding process because it has the integrated bedding block from Manners, which is the mini chassis. And we have this set up. You guys can see if we take a look down here underneath, it's got the extended magwell, which I really like, especially at night. You can get a good feel for it. You know where it is. If you need to do a mag change, you're not fumbling around looking for the slot. You can run your hand down, you can feel it. We've actually used it a lot of times to, to barricade up into a fence line, into a fence, uh, into a lot of different things, wood piles, etc. It, it's a It's a nice feature and I really like it. Moving back, you can see also along the trigger guard, it's got a very ergonomic, it's almost contoured, it is contoured with the trigger guard is the mag release and i really like that feature because of the 
elimination of any snags. There is nothing extra that sticks out to release this mag. And it's ambidextrous. I mean, you can, you can run it from the right side, you can run it from the left side. And like I said, it's contoured with that trigger guard. I really, really like that design. Taking a further detailed look at the stock, you can see that this has the adjustable cheek hardware, a huge asset for us. It's, it's really a necessity because of the fact that if you take a look at this thermal, if you look at the mount, this has the D-lock mount, it elevates your optic significantly. I mean, we're looking at, uh, you know, from the center of the bore line to the center of your, of your eye relief or to the center of where you actually put your face, your eye into the ocular, you're looking at very close to two inches. So being able to have that adjustable cheek weld just gives you that modification that you need to make this work and have a more comfortable cheek weld, the proper eye relief. And I, I really firmly believe that that helps in a lot of our shots, not just for a night hunting rig like this, but for a day hunting rig also. You'll see most of our rifles, if not all of them, have an adjustable cheek piece. This stock also has uh, a couple flush cups on the left-hand side, which is by design. I had it made that way because our bolt were right-handed. Uh, we're all righties, so the bolt throw is on the right-hand side. The bolt handle sticks out the right hand side if you do want to sling it up it has two flush cups so you can run qd uh, swivel studs and uh, you can sling it up on your back without having the bolt handle you know sticking you in the back or hanging up on anything it's just designed that way most of the time we run stock packs so we don't even mess with it uh, also the back of the stock you guys can see this is a nice design i like it i don't really want to uh, miss it it's just a thumb hook that comes into play a lot for us when we're proning out it allows you to get your thumb hooked underneath and push or i should say pull that stock into your shoulder pocket i i really like that design that's come in uh to play a lot of times for us towards the fore end this this stock is inleted for I think I have this stock inleted for an M24 or AMU contour, which is a little bit wider than what this barrel is. But once again, once we touch base on this barrel, we go over the details on it. You'll, you'll kind of understand why, but it, it was by design. So we absolutely have zero interference or contact with this barrel after the recoil lug. Down here at the front of the fore end of the stock, we have a pick rail a four end pick rail and what we do, and you'll hear me say this, all, all this stuff is really redundant fellas. It's for the bipods. It's, we run the Atlas and we also run the Harris 12 to 25 and I think the 13 to 27, but they all have ADM QD throw levers and they're quick detached. It's, it's, they snap on, they snap off, quick single handed operation. And the reason that we run those is because if, if we can go prone, we will. But a lot of times when we do go prone, we have to elevate ourselves a little bit, whether it's above a grass line, whether it's something little like a bait pile or a set that's got a little bit of a, of a draw or recess in front of us. There's been plenty of times where we have had to back out and swap the Atlas for the Harris. And that's a quick, easy setup. We always carry an extra bipod with the ADM QD throw lever in our packs. It's, it's just a slick setup. I think that's pretty much everything that we got going on the stock. This is just, I mean, it's hard to see on this particular rifle, but there is a little bit of a, of a Cerakote camouflage pattern here. We have a flat dark earth with a lighter desert sand underneath. It's just kind of a digital camouflage pattern that LRI did for us. It's, it's a real discreet, uh, not a whole lot of contrast, but I like it. It's, it's something pretty cool. One of the, I think the best upgrades that a guy can do to a rifle starting is the trigger especially for us where we're doing a lot of simultaneous trigger pulls where we do a countdown and we kill multiple coyotes at the same time, whether it's two guys shooting at the same time or in the, the past few instances, 
three guys shooting at the same time and having a crisp, clean, custom trigger pull is it's really a necessity to get that down. And this particular rifle uses the Timney. What we put in in these particular series of rifles, we're running the Timney 510. It's got a little bit wider than normal trigger. I like it. It's real comfortable. Most of our rifles aren't set too light, but they're right around that that two pound area so that all of them are a very similar pull in case we need to swap between rifles and nothing is out of the ordinary. So that's what we're running on the trigger. Moving up from there, we're running a, a Bighorn Arms SR3 action. I, I like this action. It's got the 20 MOA base. The pick rail comes with it. It's more of a, of a hunting style is what their design was in this action. We haven't had any issues with them. A very precise, very well manufactured action from Bighorn Arms. And it's just a short action. This rifle is chambered in 22 250, so we're just running the standard 308 bolt face on it. I'm not going to go into, into a lot of, of build components specs on the on the action. You guys can look that up, but it is a custom SR3 from Bighorn Arms in the short action. And like I said, going back to to kind of briefly explain to you guys that may not understand this manners stock is inleted for the remington 700 action or the clones or the, or the it's got a 700 blueprint so what that means is most of these actions nowadays whether it's a surgeon whether it's a bighorn arms whether it's a a, uh, a defiance, uh, even the gunworks actions, all most of the actions nowadays that are custom have a Remington 700 blueprint, which means you can drop it right in the stock that's inleted for it. You torque it down and it fits. That's the beauty of building these. It's, I mean, you can modify them, you can change them up how you want to. And just looking at this real quick, I'll mention this. This is gonna be the, just taking a look at the bolt. This bolt is fluted. I'm not going to go into detail on all of like the bolt face, the bolt head, everything like that. But this is a tool. This has a toolless firing pin removal. I could pop this off with my hand, take it apart, reassemble it without any tools. The other thing to kind of take note at, and you guys will see this with uh, the initial motto, this bolt has uh, a light fluting pattern. And that is because, uh, you know, we, we like to have that feature. We like to have that option because of the conditions that we run in. We're in a more uh, sandy, more arid climate. And what that flute does is it allows us to have that dirt and debris that get into our action and into our bolts kind of congregate into those grooves and allows us to have a free, uh, less hiccups, less failures with our bolt. A lot of times you, you, you pull them apart to clean them and there is a lot of dirt and debris on there. Another thing to take a look at is our bolt knobs. We tend to gravitate more towards the more aggressive style bolt knobs and that's by design because a lot of times at night when we're out, it's cold and it's nice for us to be able to operate that bolt, run that bolt knob, grab that bolt knob, run the bolt without having to not feel it when your hands are numb a lot of times they are and it's just something that we kind of that we look for when we build our rifles that we actually optimize that we we integrate into our rifle builds looking at the uh everything good looking at the the barrel let's just roll up to the barrel this is the same exact, like I said, most every build component on this is the same as the other rifle that I went over. This is the Hardy Rifle Engineering Carbon Fiber Barrel. This is a custom contour. I had a lot of questions from guys about these barrels. I was actually uh, an importer. I got my import license and did it for about a year. The, you know, just to kind of give you a brief story about it, the reason that I quit doing it is because Hardy Rifle is awesome. They're, they're awesome guys. Dan Hardy was an awesome guy to work with. I've said it before, I'll say it again. They make some very high quality equipment. They're based out of New Zealand, but the logistics, I mean, it was $200 to ship one barrel or $200 to ship a dozen barrels. And so I had a dozen of these custom contoured barrels sent over they were all 224 
this, like I said, is our uh, ops exclusive contour, which I would say if you look at it, it's really, it's a little bit bigger than a heavy Sendero, a little bit smaller than an M24. You can see the flow, the chamber slopes down to at the end of the chamber, the barrel is a straight taper from the end of the chamber all the way to the muzzle. Uh, I would say I could measure this with a caliper, but it's a little over 0.9. 910 or 0.9 and a quarter somewhere in there at the muzzle just to give you an idea of the of the the diameter but the logistic side of things it, it just didn't make sense to try to to import that many and i mean they were gone quick we did have a quick run and we have i have a lot of guys question a lot of guys wanting to know if they can still get them they shoot freaking amazing these things are precision barrels they are a 6R rifling, and all of ours have a 1 and 8 twist. Of course, these are all, they were all 224 barrel blanks. I have one that I've just built a Creed on, it's just hammers. Like I said, this is a 22258 twist, 6R rifling. It's got the carbon fiber wrap, and uh, it, this one here is finished off at 18 inches. We did have a couple more that were 22, and I misspoke. We did have some. 6.5s done as well because I have yep I have a I have a 6.5 Sherman short that has a hardy rifle and engineering barrel on it so we had some 6.5s some 224s and uh I might have even had a couple 308s I did cuz I had Tyler Tyler and Amantine bought a 308 caliber barrel for me anyway it's it's a little bit easier working with manufacturers in the United States because you don't have to mess around with all the BS paperwork. I mean, it's it's a whole bunch of other BS that you have to do to import these. Go through customs. It's freaking just. It'd be awesome to do it. I would continue to do it, but the paperwork side of things is is pretty pretty much of a pain in the ass. All right, guys, let's just move on down to the end here. After taking a look at the Hardy Rifle Engineering Carbon Fiber Barrel, she is wearing the Ops Two Two Four Vapor Suppressor that we designed as an exclusive through SRT Arms. Just kind of do a brief rundown on that can because that's kind of, of, not kind of, it is one of our passions. We really enjoy hunting with suppressors. We enjoy shooting with suppressors. I would say we got into it well before the NFA industry even took off. And it's been something we've been doing for over 15 years now. And to put a blunt information is worth its weight in gold. That's one of our, our goals is to provide you with information. And we've been very fortunate in our line of work to be able to hunt, shoot, film, kill with hundred with, with, I would say close to over a hundred different makes models of manufacturer suppressors. So being able to take information from us, from the field, give it to you so that you could possibly do, you know, a one-time purchase, it's it's a, a nice option to have taking a detailed look at this suppressor like i said this is the ops 224 vapor this is 6 al 4v seamless hydraulic tubing the 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 baffles are 6 al 4v the tube is seamless uh aerospace hydraulic tubing titanium end caps titanium uh threaded end cap this particular can is half by 28 uh, we can get these in any configuration that you want. 5 8 by 24, half by 28. For those of you that aren't real familiar with it, general rule of thumb, anything 224 caliber and down is half by 28. Most of your 22 long rifle cans, your, your 5.56, 5, your 223, the 224 vapors, half by 28. Anything above that, looking at your 6 millimeters, 6.5s, your 7s, your 30 cals, 5 8 by 24. But we are getting into a lot of guys. That, that are putting 5 8 by 24 threads on their 220 Swifts, their 22 Creeds, and even their 22 250s. So it's not a problem. We can configure this suppressor to fit your rifle if you have that kind of a thread. The overall length is 8 inches. It's really close to 12 and a half ounces. And like I said, we do offer a 6 millimeter vapor that's in the same length, 1.5 outside diameter, same as this. We also offer a 6.5 and a 7 millimeter vapor as well. This is one of our go-tos. 99% of the kills that we get on video are with the 224 vapor on our 22250s. Awesome suppressor. You can get them Cerakoted in black. We can get them Cerakoted in tan. Really whatever you want. We have 
the tab gear suppressor cover. We get a lot of questions on these also. This particular model is the SAS R from tab gear. If you guys have any questions, all you do, I mean, you measure your outside diameter, you measure, measure your overall length, you can order it from tabgear.com. Tony Burks, tell him that we sent you. This particular model is the SAS R and it is in the multi-cam aired camouflage pattern. All right, guys, I think that we've covered all the bases. We've looked at everything on the rifle. Now let's take a look at the thermal because after all, like I said earlier, I, I firmly believe that the thermal weapon sites are what make these rifles application specific. And uh, if you haven't seen it, I'll make sure and post a video link up of it on the YouTube channel of our other rifle that's configured very similar, but we're running the Trijicon Mark III. And here's where I got to put a plug in to Tyler 8 Air at Ultimate Night Vision because similar to the suppressor side of things similar to the 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 suppressor information that we provide to you thermal and night vision also relate very very close to the same thing because here's the thing when you're going to invest x amount of dollars in something that you've never used guys thrive on information they they want information and that's a lot of the stuff that we are very uh, fortunate to be able to do with a company like Ultimate Night Vision. We can run, I mean, we've ran numerous. We've ran, uh, I mean, I can I can name every single, pretty much every thermal night vision manufacturer out there. L, L3, Envision Optics, Pulsar, Chizikon. Uh, Chizikon also owns Oasis. We ran a lot of those units. Armasite, who's owned by FLIR now. We run a lot of FLIR units. Um, or we have FLIR Drone, FLIR Breach 6, 40 and I'm not supposed to talk about that. Uh, some, I mean, a lot of different things like that, that, that we're very fortunate to run that a lot of guys can't. And so us being able to provide you information is, is essential. That's what we enjoy doing. And a lot of guys really, uh, appreciate that, you know, because would you rather come to somebody like us who use this stuff, who kill with this stuff, who film with it, who hammer with it and 30 below to, 60 above or go to Cabela's or Shields and not bad mouth in any company, but you talk to somebody behind the counter that's never even looked through one. That's our goal is to get our hands on equipment like this and not bad mouth anybody out there, but give you guys proper insight with our experience in the field. And that's what ultimate night vision allows us to do run a plethora of different makes models of once again, manufacturers equipment so that we can use it for our job but also provide insight to you. So this particular model, enough rant, enough chatting about that, this particular model is the Pulsar XP50LRF. And this is really, uh, I would say, the first of its kind. A thermal weapon sight with an integrated laser rangefinder. And, and this is actually the Mod 2. This is the Trail 2 which there's been some, some significant upgrades. A lot of you guys that have ran the older trails know of some of the issues with them, but this has significant upgrades and this is one of the units that we've been running for a while. Actually, John runs this particular uh, weapon site. We're gonna briefly touch base on some of the features, kind of uh, some of the broad features without going into detail of like, every reticle type, every color palette, all that, you know, it, it's, it's got a lot of them, but we're not going to go into a, a lot of detail on those. That's for something that you can kind of check out. And if you want to hit us up through email or on the YouTube channel, you can sure ask us what our preferences are and we'll tell you, but for video purposes, we're going to briefly touch base on some of these features that this optic has. So once again, this is the trail 2 XP 50 LRF XP 50 film, 50 millimeter germanium lens. Um, you guys can see that, uh, it's a, a fairly discreet, let's just go like this. We'll kind of break it down. This is the LRF and there's a couple different options on here that you can set it. I mean, you can set it to where it conti continuously gives you a digital readout on the screen inside. You can set it so that you just press a button and whatever your target is, it'll shoot back a range to you real quick. A lot of different options, a lot of different features, but the base of this scope is a 640 resolution and this has the 17 Euless core. The visual of this is, a, uh, I'm, I'm really impressed with the visual of this scope. 
The Mark 360, I would say, is probably, to be honest, the top tier unit that I've used. But this is, this is an awesome scope. This optic has a two to eight magnification, two being the optical on the low end, eight being the digital on the high end. It also has a picture in picture that's, I think, a, a really nice feature to be able to utilize that for a more precise hold. One of the big differences between the, the Mod 1 and the XP50 LRF Mod 2 is the housing. This has the magnesium alloy shockproof housing. And a lot of guys had issues with the Mod 1s shifting zero on them for whatever reason. We, we ran the Mod 1 and didn't have any issues, but this is supposed to be a lot more rigid and eliminate that problem. This has a, a really nice display. I was, I was really actually really impressed with the full color AMOLED display. There is a noticeable difference between this Mod 2 and the Trail 1 version. It's a lot clearer and a lot more distinct picture, a lot more contrast. A couple of the other features that I really like about this optic that, that save a lot of time and, you know, a lot of headache is the one shot zero. I think, you know, I, I touched base on the Mark III, how I zero the rifle for the Trijicon units. You just, you shoot. I set up at 30 yards, move back to 50 to 60 and fine tune it at 100. With the one shot zero, it, it's literally a one shot zero. As long as you're on paper, you basically activate it. You put a reticle over your bullet hole and it automatically zeroes the setup, and then you, you can fine tune it from there if you need to, but it saves a lot of time. Another thing that I really like about this are the battery packs. The, the option to have an integrated battery on the side of the unit for somebody like us and what we do is a huge asset because, I mean, it, it just saves you a lot of time. There's the IPS7, and then the IPS 14. This is the seven. You can tell it's contoured. It's flush with the side of the of the scope itself. Where you get into the IPS 14, which is an 18 or 20 hour battery pack. This is the eight to 10 hour battery pack. The IPS 14 sticks out significantly more, but you get also quite a bit longer runtime. It's just a really nice feature to be able to take these on and off in a matter of seconds versus having to retrofit an optic with some kind of external battery source. Another, you know, another thing I probably should mention about these is it has a stream vision and that's, you can, you can download the stream vision app on your phone or on an iPad and another user can watch what you're doing with the scope so you can you can you know let a friend let a buddy let a kid watch through an ipad or a phone it, it live streams the feed from the optic to a smart device and it's it's a nice feature we don't ever really use it but it, it's it's integrated into it and it's a, a a something that i should probably note that's part of the unit itself you can see up here another thing that we like on these scopes is being able to, for, for the videography aspect, being able to fine tune and, and try to focus on our target as precisely as we can. And that's what you got your focus knob up here. That's a really nice option for us because we can fine tune it. It's not, you know, nothing against the Trijicons. They're all basically set out to uh, infinite focus so you don't ever have to mess with it and they work pretty good unless you get pretty damn close you know if you get a target close you, you do get some blurry images but with this as long as you're manipulating the focus you can fine tune it and get a crystal clear image i really like the the onboard recording feature because of the fact that when you pull the footage the the footage that you get the footage that that's compressed is very usable for what we do. It stays very high quality and it looks really good on the screen as opposed to having to retrofit some kind of a DVR when all that footage is compressed. 
it, it just does not look good. So we were doing a lot of the things with the Chizikun units to make that footage look good. And it, it, it put a hamper, it put, I mean, put a damper on what we were doing. It was a tough uh, situation in a, in a lot of the hunts that we took to be able to try to power the weapon site itself as well as the recording device. With this, it's integrated. The footage is very usable and it's a, a force multiplier for something that we will do for sure. The, I'll, I, the field of view on this scope is very similar to the REAP. Although this does have a 50 millimeter germanium and the REAP has a 35, the, this, the sensor is different. This has a 17 versus the 12 that the Chizikon has. So you're going to have a little bit different uh, field of view in relation to the germanium lens size. But this is really close to the 12.4 degree field of view and it's a nice happy medium because for us i like to kind of say that we have all the bases covered because this year in particular we're all going to be running helmets so we're all going to have thermal as well as night vision if not both on our helmets so we have the wide field of view taken care of so we can utilize weapon sites that have a narrower degree field of view but in this particular example, like I said, this is, is really what makes the rifle application specific by having an integrated laser rangefinder and having that uh, happy medium field of view. It makes that, that weapon sight very functional for not only some of the longer shots, but primarily for the mid and closer shots as well. Another thing, I just had a fella, a fella that's working with us right now is these come from ultimate night vision with the d-lock mount you can see this has got three recoil lugs it's got a patented design that you can you can finger tighten this and you can finger loosen it it's got a, a machined nut on the inside of this knurled nut so that if you want to torque it down with the torque wrench you can do it but I just had this fella, and we, we've done it before. We don't, we don't do it often. We've done it before, but it's not something that we really ever do because most of the time when we have a scope like this, we torque it to spec, and it stays on this rifle. It does not come off. But there have been guys, especially the fellow that we're working with right now, he's got an XP50 LRF Mod 2 just like this, and he said he was just out the other night. He had it zeroed on his rifle. He has, yeah, he's, he's got a, a custom rifle also. He had it zeroed on his rifle. He took it off, just drove around, scanned with it, put it back on his rifle, shot a group dead nuts. In theory, that's how it's supposed to happen. It doesn't always happen that way, but with the precision that these guys machine equipment and, and components like this nowadays, you can pretty much bet that it's gonna be at least men in a coyote. I don't like even thinking about that, but I mean, no matter how good your equipment is, personally, no matter how expensive our scopes are, every time that we go out and we know we're going to be getting into them, which is almost every night, I send around at 100 yards. I send around at 100 yards to verify zero, make sure my stuff didn't change because to me personally, as soon as you move away from mechanical adjustments like your day optics and you get into digital it's kind of a touchy subject. I mean, you've got a lot of variables going on. You've got batteries to worry about. You've got heat sinks inside. You've got stuff warming up. You've got stuff contracting when you're in sub-zero to colder climates. You've got a lot of stuff moving. And it's part of what we do, testing stuff like this up here to see what works, to see what holds zero. We've had a lot of success, success with this unit. We've had a lot of success, especially with the Chizikon units. And uh, I mean, if we didn't, we wouldn't be using it. So that's why I'm going over this because we use it and because it works. And this is an awesome feature. The main key feature in this is the LRF. That's one of the, that's probably one of the most redundant questions that we get asked is, or, or concerns about is, hey, you know, I'm having a hard time judging the range. Well, without being a dick, if you don't know the range, you obviously don't know your capabilities, so don't shoot. And that's exactly the principles that we abide by personally with all, with the guys that I shoot with. 
we know if that coyote's within range because of what he looks like on the screen. And if he's too far away, we know it. Whether or not we have a range finder or not, our goal is to get him as close as we can to fool that animal and make a precision shot. We're not lobbing rounds 100 yards or 200 yards. That's for you to decide and you to do it. But if you don't know the range, this will do it. But like I said, with the equipment that we're using, we can tell that's one of the most asked questions is how do you guys know how far they are? How do you guys know when to shoot? The more time you get behind it, the better you get, just like everything. But it's not too hard to figure out. Get a target, set it up at 100 yards, set it up at 50 yards, and get an idea of what it looks like through your thermal and then relate that to real life. And it's just something that, that I firmly believe in. If, if you don't know your range, obviously you, you shouldn't be tripping the trigger. You should not be squeezing that trigger. And uh, that's, you know, it, it, but like I said, the feature of this is a laser range finder for those of you that don't know. That's an awesome feature to have because that could be the difference between you knowing that you can make the shot and you not knowing or not taking that shot, knowing that you shouldn't take that shot. I'll try to show, like I said, throughout this video, I'm going to try to show you guys some, some overlay of the thermal, what it looks like in comparison to uh, probably the Chizukun Mark III, possibly even the Reap. I'll do some video overlays without getting too elaborate on it. I just kind of wanted to show you guys one of the rifles that we designed that we use because we get a lot of questions on it. And a lot of you guys don't find videos like this very entertaining, but this is more for informational purposes so you guys can see how meticulous we are when we build and when we use custom equipment. This is something that we take very seriously, especially at night. I mean, our daytime rigs are set up for precision. They all, all of our rifles that we design, that we shoot, that we hand load for, shoot in the same hole. That's what they're designed to do so that if something happens, we know that it's not the equipment that failed, that it's us. And when you apply those principles to nighttime hunting, it's, it's a force multiplier because you're in an environment that you're not normally in. And so you have to take that into consideration. You have to be precise with your work because, I mean, you got to know the layout of the land like the back of your hand. That's what we do. It's 100% what we do. If you don't know what's behind that hill, if you don't know what's in that pasture, you shouldn't even be there. There's always safety guidelines and a lot of guys kind of overlook our videos because they're seeing coyotes just getting hammered. But there's a lot of work that goes into what we do and we want you guys to know that. So that's why we're bringing videos like this to light so you guys can understand our workflow, what we do, how we do it, and why we do it. So hope you guys enjoy it. Hope you guys found this video more informational than entertaining. But we're going to be doing some podcasts that are coming up. A lot of awesome podcasts. We've got Tyler Adair with Ultimate Night Vision. I think Rich, Rich Ashar is going to be on with him. And we've got them for the guest host tomorrow. Or if not, this they might have already been done regarding this video. But uh, there's going to be a ton of information there. If you guys haven't and you haven't taken a look at it, be sure to check out uh, our podcast on the Anchor platform. It's Predator Hunter, Predator hyphen Hunter, or James O'Neill. And you guys can hear us BS about a lot of different topic, topics that we're in, enthusiastic about or that we have um, some knowledge about. What we try to do is get subject matter experts on that know more about things like this than we do because most of the shit that we figure out has been a failure in the field, so we learn. And usually you learn to where you don't forget that way. We don't want you to have to go through it because we do. Anyway, hope you guys found it entertaining. More importantly, informational. Be sure to, uh, you know, we'd appreciate it if we could earn a subscriber for our YouTube channel. Our goal is 100,000 subs. We do have an Instagram page for some pretty cool pictures. I'd like to think you guys might enjoy some of the pictures that we take. We have Facebook where we post uh, certain information up here and there. And then, of course, like I said, we've got the podcasts. A lot of information, a lot of content that we're really trying to provide. We've got some cool guys out there that are going to be coming in and joining us, filling you guys in with more information that we ever could. Hope you guys enjoy it. I'm James O'Neill, and this has been an O'Neill Ops weapon review from the loadout room with equipment that is designed for killing. O'Neill Ops.
We're out. Tripled. Tripled.